we meant more billionaires in the alternatives industry than any other industry. There's more billion. Let's go look at the, the, what is it? The fortune 500 or the, whatever it is, Forbes 500. Forbes. Yeah. There's twice as many asset managers doing alternatives investments as there are technologists. Now the technologists are in the hundred billion category, whereas most of the asset managed billionaires are 1 billion to, you know, 50 billion, not bad though, but twice as many billionaires in the asset management industry. Well, Ashby, I've been really looking forward to the interview. Uh, you have one of the most interesting backgrounds in the space, and today you serve as the Executive and Research Director at Stanford Long-Term Investing Research Center. Welcome to Limited Partner Podcast. It's awesome to be here. Any chance to talk about pensions and sovereign funds? I love it. Well, we both have the same uh, professional and personal interests, so we both kind of live uh, pretty dull lives, but I'm excited nonetheless. <laughs> Uh, what is the Stanford Long-Term Investing Research Center? We are maybe the only research center in the world focused on investment decision-making at limited partners, allocators, institutional investors. The funny thing about these organizations is we don't even really know what to call them. Um, I, I sometimes just have to rattle them off. Pension fund, sovereign fund, endowment, foundation, family office, permanent fund, stabilization fund, legacy fund. I could go on and on. I, I, I've found about 45 different names for these asset owners. The latest being a waqf, which is a Islamic charity. And there's 33,000 of them in Saudi Arabia representing $2 trillion. And I just learned about them about a year ago. Um, but yeah, we study all these, these asset owners. That's our job. So you mentioned $2 trillion. That's a good hefty amount of money. Uh, but off off camera, you told me that this asset class or the asset classes together total $140 trillion. How do you go about studying an asset class of $140 trillion? I sometimes joke that we're a little bit like the show Seinfeld. I feel like I have to describe the show now because we're all old and, and there's a lot of people who are like, what? But Seinfeld was a show about nothing, right? And sometimes it feels to me like I'm doing research projects about nothing because I'm asking, hey, why aren't these big institutions investing more in infrastructure? U.S. has huge infrastructure needs. These big pension funds want allocation to infrastructure. Why aren't they investing? So we end up asking a lot of those types of questions, which are like more about studying around the black hole rather than being able to go into the black hole because there's no data about things that don't exist. Why don't pension funds do more direct investing? Why don't sovereign funds do more venture capital? These are the types of questions I get constantly. And then those form the basis of research projects. We also do a lot of traditional stuff, case studies. Um, we collect a lot of data. We run regressions. We write papers. But anything and everything that relates to how these big pools of capital make decisions, that's fair game. And you're housed within the engineering center, not within the uh, Stanford GSB, the business school. Why is that? Yeah, people love to just give me grief. They're like, you should be in the business school. And I want to say, this is my great moment where then I'm like, have you ever worked at a pension plan? Do you know what it's like to work at the California Public Employees Retirement System? It does not feel like a business. Most of these asset owners have one foot sitting squarely in some administrative bureaucracy, could be a university, could be a charity, could be the HR department in a company, it could be um, a government. Uh, most of it is um, about governments around the world saying, hey, let's reduce the cost of some future benefit by incentivizing private industry to accumulate wealth in a fund. That's what a pension fund is. It is a way to reduce the cost of a future um, liability stream. The liability stream being a pension. Same stuff with sovereign funds and endowments and foundations. All these things are about paying down something in the future at lower cost. And the governments have decided we are gonna incentivize that with tax advantages. Most of the times the contributions are tax-free, the, the money compounds tax-free, and the money is returned sometimes tax-free. So none of that to me sounds like a business. 
Um, and when you see how they operate, how authorities are delegated, how we compensate the people working in these organizations, they are definitely not like businesses. They are more like government um, entities, more like central banks than they are like Microsoft. It is an encumbrance on the commercial activity. It's also an advantage. It also gives them, a, you know, a long time horizon. It gives them legitimacy in the minds of the people. There are many reasons why we could argue they have advantages over the private sector, but they are definitely not operating in the same way that businesses do. They're not optimizing for shareholder value. They're optimizing for a range of topics. And so I think it's for that reason, ultimately, that we think they need their own research program. In fact, I can promise you that there's basically no classes in the world, except for one that I designed, about how pension funds, sovereign funds, endowments, and foundations actually invest, why they exist, how they invest, and how they achieve their goals. So, so let's double click on that. So why is it that, why is it that a pension fund? Why is it that the endowment? Why is it that a foundation? Why don't they just purely invest for economic purposes? Why do they exist? I'm serious. And tell me why exist, they exist. They exist to distribute funds in a predictable way to their stated goals. Those are about right. Yeah. They've, in the distance, they've got some liability profile. They're, they're paying some pension. Uh, they're paying, they're stabilizing some commodity price for a government. They are reducing the cost of healthcare research in the case of a foundation. Those goals are distant and those goals are usually social. So they are the, they are typically today the foundation of our modern social welfare state. And you can say, but that doesn't get in the way of the investment practices. Fine. That's fine. You can say the investment practices need to be about maximizing risk adjusted returns. And for the most part, all these organizations, except for family offices, where there's a principal involved, do say they are maximizing risk adjusted returns. But it doesn't change the complicated nature of the organizations themselves. The people on the boards of directors are policemen, firemen. You know, they're citizens of Emirates. You know, the, these are not icy veined capitalists. There's a representative interest to oversee the um, investment strategy to ensure it meets the social objective. Because somebody's decided they're not going to spend the money today. Otherwise, they would just spend it. They're going to put it into this organization for the future. Well, once you put it into the organization for the future, then you're going to need oversight. You're going to need compliance. You're going to need regulation. You're going to need all these different things. And that starts tying it back to the government. And that's where it becomes difficult to just say, shouldn't these just, shouldn't they just maximize risk adjusted returns? Yeah, well, they should, but we aren't actually unleashing them to do that. Go look at the compensation of CalPERS, CalSTRS. How about Contra Costa? You know, go look at their compensation and think, does that feel like the free market operating? No, it's a government. You mentioned CalPERS. We were introduced by Dr. Russell Reed, former C chief investment officer of CalPERS and current CIO True. of 10X Capital. And we could both look up what he earned at, uh, at CalPERS, which we'll both agree was underpaid given the responsibilities that he had at CalPERS. How should pension funds and how should these asset managers be compensating uh, their CIOs and the rest of the management with more money <laughs> is the punchline. You know, if you think about as a society, we're totally comfortable paying football coaches three, four, or five million bucks a year. You know, these are state schools, um, and and these football coaches, you know, they're in effect overseeing a state program and they're getting huge wealth. You flip, you flip the script around and you say, okay, how about these state employees overseeing 30 billion, 100 billion, 500 billion of dollars? Who's going to add more value to the state's bottom line? Who's going to actually protect the state from insolvency? It's not the football coach. And so you, you start to ask yourself, well, why aren't we recruiting the best and brightest to come and work in these organizations? We are now, we're starting to, the, over the last five years, you've seen compensation and incentives dramatically transform. But up until then, you were really relying on people's public service instinct, their desire to work on Stanford campus and be a member of the community. You know, a big part of the Yale model was Yale alums working at Yale, 
giving allocation to Yale. It was all about giving back. And ultimately, I would simply say that was a huge subsidy to the private equity industry. Okay. If we're not paying people at the base of capitalism, the pension funds, you're going to pay somebody else a lot more to manage their money. And that's what we've observed. The Canadians used to say it costs 10x less to do it in-house and we don't have to generate the same return, the same gross return to achieve a higher net return. And so that's why they, you saw so much internalization going on there. Tell me about the Canadian model. I know they have a unique model to have people making seven figures. How did that come about and how is that working? came about because they have a crown corporation uh, model that allows them to first um, select and appoint board members that are kind of fit for the task of overseeing a multi hundred billion dollar pension plan. It's a double arms length nomination procedure and the jargon of governance nerds like myself. So the people that end up sitting at, on the boards are usually people who come from industry and the boards have huge authority. They pay salaries, they set delegation frameworks, they resource the organization, and they approve the asset allocation. So that's a lot of different stuff that the board does. Most important is, in my view, resourcing the organization for success. And when they're looking at their liability profile, they're looking at their asset base, they were one of the first systems to get very granular on the fees and costs paid to the private equity, venture capital, hedge fund, on and on and on. And they just sat back and they said, is this the best way to produce the return stream? Just giving money to the, the for-profit managers. And the realization was, well, actually, if you can build internal teams, maybe you can produce returns at lower cost and actually reduce the risk. And it all started with transparency data and starting in the nineties, uh, moving into the two thousands, the maple eight, they all have the same crown corporation model. They all began to internalize. And then they all began to realize there were certain asset classes. This is kind of flashing forward 20 years to almost the present certain asset classes. It makes tons of sense, real estate, infrastructure, timberland, certain asset classes. It doesn't venture capital, private equity where you need on the ground personal relationships, the deals are smaller, it's harder to um, originate things. And so in those asset classes, which I know you're probably most interested in, um, they are um, very much partners. They're partners with the GPs. So no one's going after our two and 20 or the Sequoia three and 30 in the venture capital asset class anytime soon. That's great. Oh, don't, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you you're right. Actually, you're right. No, no, you're, you're right. There are platforms that are now out there trying to seed new managers. Um, but I think that will take time to disrupt the, the auto correlation embedded into the Sequoia model. Um, even if the, you know, these folks got embarrassed in, in FTX for not doing enough due diligence or actually imposing a board, um, they're still, you know, they're still seen as like the preeminent brand. And I think their returns also show this over the long term that accessing the top quartile venture is still one of the greatest asset classes in the world. One thing that shocked me is how many pension funds there are in the United States. Tell me a little bit about the TAM. Well, you can almost back into it and just say to yourself, um, where does the typical money manager, professional money manager, not retail, but professional get their money. They usually get it from an endowment or a pension. And it's usually not a defined contribution plan that you have, you know, at work. It's usually a big public pension plan. Um, there's about 700,000 pension funds uh, across the U.S. That number is changing because plans are, are consolidating, closing. Uh, the old defined benefit pension plan, which promised you a pension till the day you died, was sort of a, an annuity mixed with an employment contract. Um, those are really going away in the private sector. I don't have one. Um, you would think that I might have one because I work at a university, but I don't. I have a defined contribution plan. And all of that stems from the realization that people are going to live a lot longer and how long is a little bit uncertain. You know, if we get the nanobots flown through our bloodstream, could we live to 140? Maybe. I don't know. 
I had some colleague at Stanford tell me at one point that the first thousand year old has been born. It's like, well, I don't want to pay a pension for, you know, 930 years. That's a long time. Um, and so you're seeing the shift to define contribution and those DC plans usually aren't quite as professional. They aren't as well governed. They don't provide as much private equity, venture capital, hedge fund access. If you think about, you know, the average person listening to this might have a 401k through their employer. They won't generally have a choice to invest in private equity. Um, so most of that alternatives exposure is coming through those traditional plans, um, defined benefit, public sector, um, university endowment, foundation. Uh, in the U.S., we have these things called permanent funds. Um, they're really just sovereign wealth funds by another name, but they are. there's a bunch of them. There's like 13 of them. Today's episode is sponsored by Badav Insurance Group. Badav Insurance Group is run by my close friend, Amit Badav, who insures me both personally and at the corporate level. Most people are not aware of the inherent conflicts in insurance, where insurance agents are incentivized to send their clients to the most expensive option. Amit has always been an incredible partner to me and 10X Capital, driving down our fees considerably while providing a premium solution. I am proud to personally endorse Amit, and I ask that you consider using Badav Insurance Group for your next insurance need, whether it be DNO, cyber, or even personal car and home insurance. You could email Amit at amit at luxstr.com. That's A-H-M-E-T at L-U-X hyphen S-T-R.com. Thank you. So are all pension plans the same? What are their typical strategies and what are they optimizing around in terms of asset allocation? Yeah, they are not the same, almost universally. So the old saying was, um, if you know one family office, you know one family office. Uh, that's the same for all asset owners. And part of it is a function of the sponsor being in a, in a distinct place on the planet. So- Alaska Permanent Fund is in Juneau, Alaska. And when you're setting out to build an asset allocation, the first thing you need to do is look at your organizational capabilities. And we wrote a, a long paper, a series of papers on this topic, but really it was crystallized in one we wrote this year called the Investor Identity. And the Investor Identity is about unraveling like the organizational capabilities because every investor may be different they may be their own little snowflake, but every snowflake is made of H2O, right? So even though they all look different, we can reduce down to a common formula. And the formula in investing is people, process, information, and capital. That's the production function. People, you can internalize them like the Canadians. You can hire consultants like the American small county plans. Process. You can run a delegated process like the Canadians, or you can run a bureaucratic process where every manager has to present in front of the board. Information, you can get it out of a Bloomberg, or you can set up an office in Rio de Janeiro. You know, th there's all these ways. The input that tends to be the most critical is the capital. What is the liability profile? What are the encumbrances? What can I do with the money? So you have that in your head and you have your people process and information, and then you can design an asset allocation. Inevitably, I then get asked, well, how can I improve my production function? How can I make more money? And that's where we did the second series of research projects where we said, basically, you only have three levers. You can pull the governance lever, the culture lever, or the technology lever to improve your people, process, information, and capital. With that, you have the entire identity of every investor on earth. And I can tell you like a thumbprint, everybody's different. Their people are different. Their process is different. Their capital, even pension funds will have different capital because their liability profile will be different. The Canada pension plan and Ontario teachers pension plan have very different um, profiles, different identities today because Ontario Teachers is a mature defined benefit pension plan, and the Canada pension plan is still in the accumulation phase, building up into the 2030s. So they can invest in very different things with different liability profiles. They can have different technologies underpinning their organizations. So let's unpack that. So governance, it's an interesting lever. Uh, I am interviewed the CIO of, of Alaska Permanent, Marcus, and he has a very flexible governance 
that allows him to really make some very interesting investments to have high concentration in funds. What are some levers that institutional investors could pull on the governance side to improve their returns? So the governance, they control the resources, the organization, the risk budget. Um, generally, they're approving a strategy. So in my view, the board is everything. Like basically I've just described all of the biggest value drivers of institutional investors. Most people in our industry will say asset allocation is the biggest driver because they're relying on the famous Brinson work, you know, that showed that asset allocation drove most of the variability in performance. That's why everybody says they do the Yale model. They don't do the Yale model. They don't have a college campus. They don't have the golf course that Swenson used. They don't have the Rolodex, but they have an asset allocation that, looks from a top down that it's like Yale. And for the most part, that does a good job. But the board also then says, how much should we be investing in our technology? How much should we be paying our people? We're, you know, Marcus sits in Juneau, Alaska. You should f ask him what it takes to hire a private equity professional on that team. I know you've already done that. I asked that exact question. I can question. tell you it's hard. You, you used to. Yeah. <laughs> you have to go stand in front of the freaking state legislature and say, I want to pay these people 300 grand. But, but the reality is I, when I look at the governance, I, I often have a couple of little tricks in my mind that I'm looking for and, and they align incredibly well with the caliber of the plan. One, you can look at the nomination procedures to the board of directors. Two, you can look at the delegation frameworks a very sophisticated delegation framework from board to chief investment officer, chief investment officer to team will speak volumes about how high, how the caliber of the investment team is. And last but not least, I'm playing with this one. How hard is it to fire people that are underperforming? Because in a big public pension plan, this is where it's not a business. You asked me earlier, are these, why don't, why don't you sit in a business school? Well, go ask big public pension plans if you can fire underperformers. And most of the time, the answer is no, they can't. Um, it's, it is more like a government. Some of them are even unionized. And the culture of these organizations can suffer if you have, a you know, the people who um, stay are the people you'd like to fire. Um, that's a bit of a, a tougher one. It's not, it's not my favorite one. It's not a cocktail party one, but it is an interesting heuristic. Ask them how hard it is to fire underperforming people. And if they're like, we just can't, then you, you have a sense for the bureaucracy and the challenges they're facing to get things done. So presumably you would call them underperforming people. I would call them C players. Uh, a lot of these C players are in these organizations. How do C players make decisions when it comes to asset allocation investment decisions? Um, in my experience, there are a lot of A players in pension funds because they're mission driven. They, like if you go, for example, to the Australian super funds, these people believe in the mission. They are willing to accept a slightly lower salary because the mission gives them joy. And that's the same at the Yale Endowment, at the Harvard Endowment, at the Stanford Endowment. And you will meet a lot of people at public pension plans that are like, I'm here because I believe in the mission. So you do get A players. And also people hate fundraising, you know? So if you hate fundraising and you end up at a good pension plan and you can just invest, that's also a delight. I've seen a lot of people that are like, I like to just invest. I hate the whole business part of asset management. Um, but then there are C players. There are they are there, right? And it's because it's hard to get rid of them. And you know that's where a lot of the bureaucracy comes from. We build process around these people because, in part, we don't trust them not to make a big mistake. Um, and and so it's funny. The more you pay your team, the more trust you have that your team can execute the more risk they can take, the more return they can draw. And so, you know, actually just hiring great people does a lot for these organizations. It allows you to push those decisions to the edge, um, power to the edge of the organization. And then they can move faster. They can do co-investments with private equity. There's, there's all these great reasons. But anyway, I'm rambling about some of this, but I think a lot of it comes back to having really good data that can prove out the business case of hiring internal people. 
And some of that is showing the cost of external managers, which has been pretty hard to pin down. You would think that the unions themselves and the pension plans would have a high incentive to make sure that their defined benefit and defined contribution plans would have the right amount of funds and would have high performers running those funds. I think some of it is just not being aware of the the dynamics of this industry. I wouldn't say it's a it's a conflict. In fact, I've I see unions pushing harder for high expected returns which in an, in effect drives the pension fund to allocate capital to private equity and hedge funds, the very asset managers that are often trying to take down the unions, you know? And so it, pension funds are this weird vehicle through which unions are in alignment with hedge funds. Because if you are using an actuarial estimate of performance and you can say, oh, well, past performance is an indicator of future performance, so we just need more private equity. And then the unions are like, let's do more private equity, because if we can say we're making an 8% return, then the fund looks overfunded, and then I can promise more benefits to my members, which, by the way, as a union, is what I'm negotiating for every single day. And so there's that strange bedfellow moment there. And so then it's left to people like us to be like, oh, 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 don't make these promises, don't, you know, don't overpromise on your expected return because it distorts this whole system. Um, We're underpaying staff at pension plans because we don't want to stomach paying public employees millions of bucks. But at the same time, we're saying, go make seven and a half percent a year. You know, it's hard to do. So then they have to go over allocate to private equity. That's why we we mint so many billionaires in private equity these days. You think they're managing their own money? They're managing pension money. Tell me more. We mint more billionaires in the alternatives industry than any other industry. There's more billion. If you go look at the, the, what is it? The fortune 500 or the, whatever it is, Forbes 500. Forbes. Yeah. There's twice as many asset managers doing alternatives investments as there are technologists. Now the technologists are in the hundred billion category, whereas most of the asset managed billionaires are 1 billion to, you know, 50 billion, not bad though, but twice as many billionaires in the asset management industry. And, it, and really I joke with my students. I'm like, look, those of you that were like have ambitions to be a billionaire, you, you need to get it right. Like you need to set up an alternative investment business and manage pension capital. That's the fastest path in the world today. Um, and how do you get to pension p- capital? I know they don't do first time funds, second time <laughs> funds. Wouldn't it be like fun if we designed the path to be a billionaire right now? Here it is. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do it. Okay. Here it is. So you graduate, you do your two years at. You KKR. graduate Stanford or Harvard. You go, Let's say you do Princeton undergrad. Okay. You run the crew team. So you, you, you have a potential to suffer. Then you did uh, two years at KKR. Then you did um, business school at Harvard or Stanford. Then you went back to KKR and a more senior team or Carlisle or Apollo or Blackstone or any of these folks. And you get, you get authority. Um, you quickly like make a name for yourself in deal teams. Uh, some senior partners fed up of paying all their carry to, you know, the powers that be that own the, the name on the side of the wall. Um, and they say, let's go start our own fund. You were, you still haven't done anything entrepreneurial yet. You just tag along. Okay. You're 27 years old. You just tag along with this person. And this person has a track record, starts building multiple funds by fund two or three. You're, um, you know, you're now a named partner. Maybe you're a junior partner, your name partner, but you're building a name for yourself. And then you start your own fund. You have a track record. You have all these deals you've done. And even though it's a first time fund, you have a ton of experience and you will give um, warmth to the limited partner community. You might be obligated to accept seeding capital and give up a little bit of your GP, but maybe not. Maybe you have some uh, partners around you that, um, you know, help round out your weaknesses. And, you know, once you're, once you've got your own general partner in private equity, you're on, you're on a track. Um, obviously you want to stack funds, you want to build more products, you want to do all those things. But if you can get to fund three in your own fund, it's yours to lose the billionaire status because the whole table is tilted directly towards your pocket. It's like, 
most of these big pensions only do fund three. They look at your track record. You don't get fired for backing the manager that has a demonstrated performance and the fees are outrageous. It's a one way option. Um, so anyway, that's our path. Maybe I should have taken that path instead of academia. Well, certainly your students are, are lucky to have you uh, in terms of the path uh, on a specific on a specific fund and, and the life cycle of fund. You know, you don't go to pension funds, but we talked off camera about this progression of different asset investors, starting with, you know, high net worth and ending with retail. Can you take us through that life cycle? Great question. So if you're. Uh... You know, if you're sitting there and we just did our, our pathway to billionaire dumb, um, at some point you want to go start your fund and you're going to need an anchor. Uh, we'd all love to walk into the, you know, Canada pension plan and ask them to drop down 250 million and get me going or the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority. It doesn't happen that way. In general, all of the emerging managers, um, the new managers, the people who are taking a, a you know, a bet on their own capabilities and building their own firm, they start with families. Uh, we have this family office model, which I literally said last week for the first time, it feels like first on board model because they're willing to be the first. Do you remember when we used to have YouTube and there would be the comment section and people would just write first at the bottom of the comment section. <laughs> I miss those days. Uh, but anyway, family offices were like writing first, you know, for your fund. They were the first into hedge funds, into venture capital, into crypto. Uh, they are also first anchors, first willing to make a bet on a new manager. And part of it, I think, is the principles of these firms are often entrepreneurial themselves. They've seen what it is to be entrepreneurs. They've made their money. Now, as you get into multi-generational wealth, I think they start to look and feel more like endowments and foundations where they're a little bit more conservative. It's their career rather than their money. If it's their money, they're like, heck yeah, I'm going to make a bet on this, you know, brilliant young person who's going out on their own. Um, and so I, I'm often introducing first time managers um, to family offices. You use the families to build your track record for fund one. Is that an alpha position or is that a dumb money position? That's an alpha position. The small managers are the managers that outperform. I mean, that that's research, you know, we could post in the show notes, like uh, small entrepreneurial managers is actually, there's a famous quote by Swenson. That's like, that's where the outperformance comes from. So getting yourself in a position to be first with entrepreneurial managers is important. Um, obviously like you, you have to do the diligence. You got to make sure you're picking people that can run businesses, not just invest. This is running a business now. Um, but that's where real outperformance happens. In fact, if you're just investing at fund three, which a lot of the pension funds and sovereign funds do, you're basically committing yourself to overpaying. At that point, if there's real outperformance, do they need you in the fund? Maybe, maybe not. Especially as venture capital, and this is a capital constrained asset class. It's like, you know, you're lucky to get in at that point. And then once it gets to fund four, you're thinking about, oh, wow, like how are they going to manage the transition from the founding CEO who wants to go own a basketball team or a pickleball league? You know, like the, there is a classic fund four problem too, because the wealth gets so big, you get distracted. Um, and so, you know, basically these pension funds are like, we've got fund three, you know, that's it to like really outperform. And then you got fund four problem. Wouldn't it be great to have the fun four problem as a GP though? You're like, oh man, I just got, I got it, my, my box at the symphony. I've got my basketball the, the team. Fun, I, the fun four problem is a pension problem, not a GP problem. No, exactly. Yeah, that's so true. <laughs> it's a problem for the LP. Um, keep you motivated. Understand who's the next generation. How are you sharing your carry? And boy, if you've ever read an ILPA DDQ, you will know that there's a lot in there about transition plans and how are you going to manage that fund for problem? They don't call it fund for problem, but that's what's in their heads. So then you go from family offices. Is it, is it next endowments and foundations? What, what, what is yeah. the next asset class? You could actually get some endowments into fund one. So the classic thing would be 
say you're starting a hundred million dollar venture fund, you get some well-known famous billionaires to plunk down money to give you a little bit of legitimacy. You know, you get Mark Andreessen and Peter Thiel, and those are good ones to like anchor your fund. Then you get some family offices and now it's starting to feel de-risked, especially because you have a, a fundraising period of 12 to 18 months. So you're doing some deals. Maybe you're even having some markups. Then you go to your alma mater. You go to the place you went to college and you say to the CIO, I'm a, I'm a badass. I'm doing these great deals. I've got these super famous people in my fund that, you know, you can see, you know who they are. Um, I'd love to get you involved because I want to give back to my university. Um, I really believe in the mission of this foundation, you know, whatever it is. And then you will see when that mission creeps in and there is this like sense of alignment, then you will see a couple of foundations and endowments, especially those that are used to going early, like MIT or um, even UC Regents. Um, they'll, they'll go early and they will come in and participate in the rounds. And then you're you're sort of off to the races because then if you deliver quick markups, that institution will be your first institution to anchor the fund to. If you do a good job, you know, then they'll be like, yeah, we're in for another 25. And now you're hitting your fundraising circuit saying, I've got this endowment in for 25. I want to bring in mostly endowments with some of the, the original backers getting their share. And then your goal in fund two is to get a pension get one pension, find one to participate. Now you might have to save $50 million of your allocation because they don't get out of bed for much less, depending on who you're talking to. It doesn't move the needle. Um, but that's, and then once you have a pension in fund two, then, you know, fund three, this is the, the sweet spot. This is where you, you crack into that Forbes 500. So it's essentially having one foot in in the tail end of the previous fund, one foot in the next fund, kind of straddling straddling funds in order to get the right institutions in each fund. Yeah, you're isn't it like can't you brag about pushing these organizations out of their comfort zone just to get access to your financial product, you know? Like they wouldn't normally do it, but be, but for you they will. That's a pretty compelling story. Let's call out the most entrepreneurial individuals in institutions and at foundations. I'm sure they'll get a lot of emails, but that, that's, a, <laughs> that's okay. We yeah. want to celebrate We want to c celebrate those people that do take real risks and generate alpha for their institutions. Who are some of these uh, endowments? Who are some of these pension funds that have been early adopters? Yeah, so um, Jagdeep Bashir at University of California has anchored many a vehicle, and he is a true innovator. You see Regents. Yeah, you see Regents. So he, he's a true innovator. Um, at BCI, uh, which is British Columbia Investments, but I don't think they go by that anymore. I think they're just BCI. We're supposed to just say the initials. Um, you know, they've got a $30 billion private equity book. They've got a new venture book. You know, they're seating and anchoring managers and their performance is astoundingly good. In New York, there's a platform called Wafra, which is actually owned by the Social Security of Kuwait. They've anchored and seated tons of stuff. First of all, they've anchored and seated a bunch of GPs. Then they led the pathway to launching Constellation Capital, which is an anchoring and seeding platform made up of other asset owners, including Alaska, which you, but also Railpen. Um, and I think there's a few others in there like OSERS and Canada Pension Plan and, and maybe a few more. Um, that's incredibly creative. You know, yes, they're partnering with peers to do that. But boy, if you're a private equity manager, you now know there is this asset owner led platform that exists to put you in business. They will try to own some of your GP. But why not? Why not share some of the wealth back with the pensioners? Mission alignment. Um, how, do you, how do you look at that? The way that I look at it is I look at a GP and as a franchise, as a, as a stream of cash flows. If I could bring my stream of cash flows by one year then that's a DCF and now from a DCF standpoint, I could give away 10, 15%. Is that the way to look at it? It could be a way. I mean, that's definitely the, the LPs want to juice their returns and own the means of production because they've observed how wealthy GPs get. And it, it is a great place to be. You want to be an owner of the GP. 
Um, remember, this is the billionaire factory. So it's a great place to juice returns. Um, from a GP perspective, I think, yeah, you're right to be thinking about it in terms of discounted cash flow. Like, how, you know, and what am I going to have to give up in the next 18 months to get this business running? Like a lot of people go, especially in venture, they go without salary for two years. You know, it's just the, the two and 20 on a $50 million fund doesn't cover a lot of overhead. I mean, you, once you um, hire a team, have a CFO, get the things in place, like you're paying yourself next to nothing. So those, um, if you can make the claim now on the GP staking business, you have to be able to make the claim that you're building a platform because they don't want to just have the carry in the $50 million fund. They want carry in your billion dollar special opportunities, you know, growth fund where the numbers get big and, and the performance and fees really drive that kind of residual. So moving, moving into a venture capital asset class, as you mentioned, this is a VC show, although I think it's really important to understand the context for the LP asset class in general. But moving on to the venture capital asset class, what are some best practices? You gave some phenomenal advice for private equity managers. What advice would you have for venture capital managers that are starting maybe on their fund one, fund two? What's what's their path to a billion dollars? So it starts with angel. It, it starts with being an entrepreneur. This part you guys are going to know better than me, probably. But but here's my perception, and this is a perception that I think LPs know, but they might not. Um, you start you start companies. First one fails. You start company number two. You have a decent exit. Uh, you start angel investing with your money. And either the angel investing goes so well that you can kind of break out on your own or after you sell company number two, you come in as kind of an operating style general partner in a fund. Um, let's assume you do the angel investing, call that the, you know, Andreessen Horowitz style. Those guys were just out there doing angel investments. Um, if you if you have a big enough name and you're doing enough interesting deals, you will get families ready to put you in business. You know, like, especially if it's just, clean terms, you know, two and 20 and no, you know, you can demonstrate track. I know that two and 20 is not light in venture capital. I saw your mouth go, what, where's my, where's my tuna, my preferred return. Once I deliver the three X, um, you know, all that's great. But, but the reality is just keep, you must be a listener of the podcast. Yeah, exactly. Um, but you know, I think you're, you're not trying to get rich off your angel investing or your early stage stuff. You're trying to get a track record, an institutional grade track record. So more important is to demonstrate your ability to get into high quality deals, invest other people's money than to like optimize around your fee revenue in this initial phase. So then let's assume that you build a portfolio that isn't just a lottery ticket. Like you happen to invest in Stripe because your friend was your friend's roommate was there but you can like have a demonstrated repeatable strategy. That's like the next key part that as the LPs start to go in, they're like, what is repeatable here? So ideally, as you're doing your angel investing, you've got some belief. In my world, we call them investment beliefs, but they could be investment strategies, whatever. You have some edge in the world where you think you have an informational advantage that you can apply. And in my world, that would be investment technology. I think I'm one of the world's leaders in investment technology. I wrote a book on the topic. The book won an award. It's been published in terms of languages and English. That's all, but most people read English. So that's fine by me. So I'm, I would say I'm like an expert on investment technology. I would go after that and I would invest in a bunch of startups there. And I would sort of build a rep with founders because the LPs will go talk to the founders about the value you're adding every time. And you'll need to give a list of like, 30 references, not three. Um, and so all of this builds kind of like your college application. You know, you, you're like building this profile of entrepreneurial credibility, investment strategy, access, ability to like discern and spot the right deals to do, ability to add value, ability to avoid headlines and be a crazy person, you know. Some people may be really good at going on Twitter and saying crazy things and getting famous, but I don't, most LPs aren't interested in, in like taking on that type of litigation risk or, you know, profile. Most LPs like manage healthcare workers pensions. You just need to remember, you know, having a bit of a low profile is in their kind of DNA. Um, and so then 
you know, you start the same process I described with the private equity where you're getting a couple family offices to, you know, throw you a bone. Maybe first fund is 10 million. Second fund is 25. You know, ideally what you're telling people is you're not changing the strategy. You're not changing the straight stage. You're just adding a zero. That's a classic line. I'm not changing the strategy. I'm not changing the stage of investment. I'm just adding a zero. And that resonates. And then, um, because nobody wants you to go from a seed incubation investor to a series B investor. Like they're totally different functions. Um, you can do it later, but you'll hire a team later to do it for you, or you'll hire a team to help you do it. But you know, it's a, yeah. And, and the way going. that's typically broached is with a outside team that has a track record doing that specific strategy. Yeah. I guess I'm implying like when you see these traditional venture funds launch, Oh, this is our growth fund. Like there'll be somebody who was a senior Goldman Sachs banker on the team. And you're like, okay, that's the growth stage where somebody has to build the financial model. That this same is, KKR guy, the prototypical yes. guy, yes. or maybe girl that went yeah. to HBS, went to Princeton yeah. undergrad. That's exactly. when he, that's another route for that one, for yeah. that person to become a billionaire as well. But that billionaire will eventually to hit the B, that, that's a pathway to a 50M, but the B, that person would then need to spin out their own growth stage and would, you know, do something wild, like let's do a crossover fund between late stage growth and public equities. And we can short the public markets that we're investing in the companies and private and we're shorting the public. You know, they're going to have some story that's going to be real exciting. I'm tempted to, to mention managers, but we'll, we'll leave it. that for I, another day. Yeah, well, so, it's your show. <laughs> it's my show. It's my show, but it's also my <laughs> reputation. You know, I, I did tell you, I have to be honest, you're not the one that wanted me to ask about about all of your companies, but I, I, I legitimately think think you are one of the top technologists in the space. It might be oh. a very non-competitive space, but I think you're, if not the top entrepreneurs, one of the top entrepreneurs, I think you're building some really interesting technologies. Uh, one of your companies was acquired by Adapar. Tell me a little bit about your operating principles in terms of building for pension funds and building for the institutional space. Yeah, my lens is always, will this chain, will this piece of technology change an investor's portfolio? I don't want to spend my time helping an asset manager sell more product. I don't want to help distribute an existing set of um, products to retail that doesn't get me up in the morning. But if I can find some data, what I call um, a portfolio positioning system, it's like GPS for your portfolio. Those are risk tools, ESG tools, impact tools, alternative data sets. Those are giving investors a granular understanding of what they own, portfolio positioning. Um, those are the types of things that an investor would have on board and immediately say to themselves, wait, we're, we're, the, we're over there? I thought we were over here. That's a really powerful type of company to build because once you can show investors that they're holding something they didn't believe they were or that they're not holding what they thought they were, you are triggering a portfolio change. And that is the most valuable thing in financial markets today, moving money from A to B. And so the reason I do that for software companies and data companies is like, once you can show an investor that this software is gonna help them hold less cash, um, which is like my, one of my favorite things to go after. It's like, let me help you reduce your cash drag, which until nine months ago was a big problem. Now it's, people are like, my cash is great. And it's like, yeah, your cash is pretty good right now. But have you moved it? That's the other thing. How many people are still just leaving their cash in a freaking bank account, earning half a percent when they could be making four and a half percent? If you're listening to this podcast, don't be that dumb. Get your cash into something that's optimized. But like you can really help a pension fund by helping them model their commitments to venture capital. Help them understand. You keep hearing about the denominator effect, but like that is a heuristic. That's a, you know, they're like, oh, we're using the Takahashi Alexander model, which was invented in the 80s by Yale in order to model our unfunded commitments and run scenarios. I promise you we can do better with software. 
Okay. We can do better with scenario planning, next generation analytics, alternative data. And so one of the companies I built, the one that I sold to Adapar, we have helped investors on average reduce their cash holdings 1.1% and increase their contributions to alternatives by 3% a quarter. If you can't make a ton more money with that profile, like then you're just not an investor. Like you're not doing it right. Um, yeah, so that's the type of stuff. Those are my beliefs. You asked me what my principles and beliefs were. I'm looking for technologies that change portfolios. Um, and that's what I like building. And what was the name of that tool that sold to Adapar? That one was Navigator. Yeah, the the company was RCI. We had RCI Navigator and Navigator was unfunded commitments and modeling projections into the future. It started with liquidity. Um, I started that with Kanishk Parashar and Joe Lonsdale. And crazy, crazy, we sold it to Adapar given our, our founder and chairman was the same founder and chairman. Uh, shout, as shout out to Joe Lonsdale. Uh, in terms of what are you currently working on? I know you, you yeah. have a couple of entrepreneurial projects. What, what's, what, what are you working on? Uh, I, I'm one of these people that are, I have a, I'm partnered with a founder, young founder, Harrison Shaw. He's 23 years old. He's walked into my office, um, three years ago and said, I want to work on pension funds. And I was like, what? It's like, this That's can't an be exciting happen. guy. Yeah. This can't be 20 happening. year old. Yeah. Um, and he's a genius. I mean, like he, he's, a, and basically I keep giving him rope with the pension fund community, the sovereign fund community. He keeps tying these beautiful knots with it. So that is a, a, a company called Shelton AI that is basically taking all the unstructured data in PDFs and, you know, turning it into delightful dashboards in real time. So it's not just taking the data out of PDFs, it's actually putting it in a context that's private equity and venture capital and allowing them to do things like see through into portfolio companies, do real-time audits of fees paid, all that kind of stuff. Again, that's like, you've got all this data, you don't even know what you own. And now all of a sudden, literally it takes 10 minutes to upload every single one of your PDFs, 10 minute onboarding. I should have said that in the beginning. That's the tech breakthrough. You've heard of other companies that might take stuff out of PDFs and present them. Um, but it takes 10 minutes. You can take a thousand capital call documents, upload it, and we'll do it in real time. Then you can see into your portfolio companies and you can say, oh, wow, this, this is where your venture capital people are going to hate us. This venture capital fund is holding this company at X. This other one is holding the same company that I'm in at Y. Same share class, same company. Why are they holding it at different prices? Then as an LP, you can go and ask the one that's holding it higher and say, why are you holding it higher? You know, that is the type of see-through and transparency that brings changes to portfolios that I'm after. Well, Ashby, I, I really appreciate you jumping jumping on the podcast. I know you're very busy. You're busy teaching. You're busy building things. You're busy evangelizing on behalf of, of the change that you want to see in the industry. As a parting words, what would you like our listeners to know about yourself, or about Shelton, about the Stanford Long-Term Investing Research Center, anything that you'd like to shine a light on? I, I just want more people to know about pension funds. You know, like I, I kind of said at the beginning that... Um, I think there's four great levers society has to like make a better place for our children and our grandchildren. We've got, you can hate this comment or love it, but we've got government, which kind of sets the rules for the system. You've got corporations, um, which are building all this stuff. Then you have the for-profit financial intermediaries, which are kind of like businesses. Then you have the asset owner community. In my mind, having been working at this for 25 years, those are the key four players. You know, there's a hundred trillion of GDP in the governments. There's 110 trillion of market cap in the companies. There's 98 trillion of AUM and the for-profit asset managers. And there's 140 trillion in the a asset owners. Of those, the asset owners are not studied or even understood. Every university in the world has a political science department. There's 10,000 business schools studying corporation. There's 484 accredited finance and economics departments in the world. There is one course in the world on pension funds, sovereign funds, endowments, and foundations, and I teach it. And I'm just blown away that we haven't spent more time as a society unraveling how these asset owners make decisions, which is why I'm on this podcast with you, David. 
because I'm so pumped that you have dedicated a podcast to this ecosystem that does get me out of the more out of bed in the morning and fires me up every day to try to make the world better by making them better. I think one of the reasons that I'm I'm in this podcast specifically is I really personally believe in emerging managers because I believe they're the spear of capitalism. I think without emerging manager managers, the incremental company does not get started. To, to use the old adage, nobody ever got fired for for hiring IBM, uh, but people do get fired for investing in emerging managers. So I think it's really important to make a strong case for investing in emerging managers. I was going to say the what on that. You can come check out our podcast at Stanford called the Don't Get Fired Podcast. <laughs> yes, please Which check is, out the Don't Get Fired Podcast. Also, what is the name of your book that you wrote? It's called The Technologized Investor. The Technologized Investor. I will put it. Hopefully, you have an audible version. Oh, my goodness. Uh, it's in English. Is it an audible? I've heard there's good tools that will turn my written word into audio now. I, I will be your first audible listener. Okay, sweet. Um, uh, and, and thank you again for Dr. Russell Reed, former chief investment officer of CalPERS, as well as former chief investment officer of Alaska Permanent Fund. And we're very excited at 10X Capital that he is our newest chief investment officer as of last November. We're coming up about a one year anniversary. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Reed. And thank you, Ashby, for jumping on the podcast. I loved it. By popular demand, the Limited Partner Podcast has officially launched our newsletter powered by Ikaria Labs, a full-service content marketing firm that is partnering with us on the newsletter. In our weekly newsletter, we will keep you updated on all things emerging managers and limited partners, including industry trends that are critical to know as an LP, VC, or founder. To subscribe to our totally free newsletter, please visit www.limitedpartnerpodcast.com. Again, that's www.limitedpartnerpodcast.com. We thank you for your support.